If you have lived in Japan for long enough, you're bound to have seen this guy at least once, whether it is on television or on advertising billboards. And his name is Kimura Takuya, one of the most famous Japanese singer and actor of all time, maintaining wide popularity in Japan for almost three decades. And who was the mastermind responsible for discovering such J entertainment icons such as Kimura Takuya as well as numerous others? That would be Johnny Kitagawa, the former founder and president of Johnny & Associates that strictly managed male idols only. Now, Johnny & Associates is not just any run-of-the-mill talent agency and Johnny was no ordinary producer. He held the Guinness World Records for producing the most number of number one artists and singles in the entire history of J-pop as well as the most number of concerts. Perhaps what this guy says in a BBC interview says it all. He is God. He's God. He is God. And God, at least in the land of Japan, he was. He was above the law. He was above any moral code. And despite taking the worst physical advantage, to put it most mildly, of young male minors with estimated victims being in the number of hundreds in the conservative range, but more realistically in the thousands if considering all the cases which were not reported with the first records of his abuse being reported all the way back from the 1950s, it means that he has been continuing this inhumane practice for more than half a century. And even with the Tokyo High Court itself confirming the abuse of male minors by Johnny as factually true in 2004 after investigation, we repeat, the very high court of the nation, meaning that all of this was not some top secret knowledge in Japan as one only had to do a simple search on the legal cases done by or against Johnny and Associates over the years, or read one of the many books written in the late 20th century by several different former male Johnny idols who took the courage to expose on the S abuse or downright R in which they suffer from Johnny the past. Again, not just one book from one old ex-male idol, several male idols who have worked under Johnny Kitagawa. So while it is true that most of the Japanese media feared reporting on any truth about Johnny over the years, due to the possible backlash in which they could receive from Johnny and his mighty talent agency to also claim that the S abuse of the teenage or often child male idols as young as 8 by Kitagawa was this top secret knowledge only known by a handful of people in the nation is also a very exaggerated claim to say the least. Many of the expose books on Johnny's crimes, such as To Hikari Genji, written and published in 1988 by former Johnny and Associates male idol Kitakoji, in fact reached bestseller status in Japan at the time. So what is most frustrating is that if we actually consider this from the deepest part of our hearts, from the perspective of the hundreds, potentially thousands of victimized minors who are taken the worst physical advantage of by this evil being and have had to endure every single day of their lives in soul-wrenching trauma and pain, was that Johnny was left absolutely unpunished and still continued this heinous, life-ruining practice onto the male minor victims until he eventually died of a hemorrhage at the ripe old age of 87. And until outside Western media such as the BBC and international human rights organizations such as the United Nations Human Rights Council had to inevitably step in, report, and seek punishment on Johnny Kitagawa and his life of evil, the nation still tried to celebrate this guy to the very end, with the very Prime Minister of Japan himself, Shinzo Abe, writing a letter of farewell for Johnny, celebrating his life and accomplishments that was publicly presented in his funeral in 2019. Now, some of the really young fans of Johnny Kitagawa who attended his quote-unquote farewell ceremony held at Tokyo Dome after his death may have genuinely not known about the predatory criminal nature of Kitagawa. They may have not been alive when the expose articles or books written on Johnny Kitagawa were bestsellers and may have also never heard about the Tokyo High Court ruling in 2004 which confirmed the S abuse of male minors by Kitagawa as true once again due to much of the mainstream Japanese media being hesitant to report anything negative regarding this industry mogul. But to say that Shinzo Abe, the very prime minister of the nation, who is old enough to have been around the block and probably had more access to confidential information in Japan than just about any other individual on the island nation, not having heard of at least one of the many, many exposés regarding Johnny Kitagawa that continuously emerged beginning all the way back from the 1960s to the high court confirmation of truth of the S abuse allegations on Kitagawa in 2004 is also highly unlikely as well. But then again, Abe, the Prime Minister of Japan at the time, still wrote that long and detailed farewell letter to Johnny, which lauded and celebrated his life and achievements, which was then showed proudly in his public funeral concert. So there went Johnny Kitagawa in 2019, without ever receiving a single set of punishment for all of the extreme and persistent S abuse in which he has committed onto the hundreds to thousands of male victims in Japan.
Johnny Kitagawa, or John Hiroma Kitagawa as his real name goes, was actually not born in Japan, but in LA, United States in 1931 and had an older brother and sister ahead of him. His family returned to Osaka, Japan in 1933, where his mother died shortly after their arrival back to the island nation. And once World War II was over, he returned back to his birth city of Los Angeles when he was 16, where he graduated from a local high school and attended LA City College for an unspecified period of time. After research, it seemed that the set of events, which occurred early on in his life, very much worked in his favor when he came to eventually getting his feet into the entertainment industry. Fortunate for him, unfortunate for the rest of the world, especially the hundreds to thousands of victims who had to suffer in his hands. It is reported that all the way back from his high school days, when he was only 16, he worked part-time as an assistant to the music director at the Ernie Pyle Theater. And his father also happened to be a Buddhist priest who worked at a Buddhist temple located in Little Tokyo in downtown Los Angeles, where in 1950, famous Japanese singers such as Hibari Misora visited the US and performed in states such as California and Hawaii, and one of the places where she performed happened to be at the Buddhist temple in Little Tokyo where Johnny's father worked at. And not letting go of this opportunity, Johnny worked in the stage production aspect of Misora's performance and gained experience as well as connections into the Japanese entertainment industry. Many other famous Japanese singers and entertainers such as Mieko Takamine and Fujiko Yamamoto came to the US to perform during the early post-war period where Johnny also worked as a part of their stage production during their US performance visit. Then a few years afterwards in the early 1950s, Johnny returned fully back to Japan with all the experience as well as connections to many of the top Japanese singers in which he had the chance to meet and work with back in LA. He did not move straight into the entertainment industry though, as during his initial years back in Japan, he worked for the United States Embassy working as an administrative staff. So it seemed like until this point, Johnny did not have much aspirations in getting into the Japanese entertainment industry with him having a stable job and being comfortably stationed at the US Embassy in Tokyo. But when the 1960s arrived, that is when he began to make his moves into the entertainment field. When Johnny was walking one day through the Yoyogi Park in Tokyo, he spotted a group of boys, many of whom were attending Yoyogi Middle School at the time, playing baseball and decided to go and talk to them. Then he scouts these boys and formed a baseball team in which he named Johnny's Youth Baseball Team with him acting as the coach. Putting his name in front of every group or entity that he creates quite literally becomes a theme by the way. While many probably didn't think much of this at the time and just thought that he was naming his baseball team Johnny's baseball team, his first ever boy band group literally as The Johnny's, his company initially as Johnny's office, his teenage talent pool as quote unquote Johnny's juniors and so on because he was the boss. After understanding his highly twisted nature and how he viewed these boys not as human beings with a soul and a set of conscience but as mere property or toys that he owns existing for the sake of fulfilling his S desires, entering their bedrooms at night, commit unspeakable S offenses onto them and leave the boy in the room with a 10,000 yen note under his blanket. God, I really detested this part when conducting the research on him as this seemed like some sort of ritual in which he followed after taking physical advantage of the boy. Like as if leaving a mere 10,000 yen note with probably a little smirk on his face after getting satisfaction can now compensate for all the soul-wrenching trauma in which he has now left onto the young boy that the boy now has to endure for the rest of his life. So as many of you may already have guessed, the sport of baseball in and of itself was not what he was really interested in. He was interested in the boys who were throwing and batting the baseball. So when the day came and Johnny Hughes baseball team could not conduct practice due to rain, Johnny took four of the members of his baseball team to a theater in Yurakcho and watched an American musical movie by the name of West Side Story. Johnny was able to then persuade the four boys from the baseball team who were all also quite inspired after watching this American musical movie for the first time to leave baseball and become the members of his first ever boy band, The Johnnies. This all happened in the year 1962. You can already tell from their outfits that Johnny just really enjoyed, you know, getting his hands on these boys. But then, it was also a sad but inevitable truth in that Johnny was talented when he came to recruiting young male talent, create boy bands, and have them reach the level of stardom. Johnny went on to create group after group of boy bands that received wide popularity across Japan. The group Four Leaves in 1967, Shonen Tai in 1985, Hikaru Genji in 1987, and most of all, SMAP in 1991, the boy band that eventually reached national level of stardom 
and what many often describe as the most successful boy band in J-pop history. And needless to say, Johnny and his talent agency by then has already reached another level of hemisphere in terms of his sheer authority and influence in the industry, essentially reaching the untouchable status of quote-unquote God in his field. But then, does the genius producing ability of Johnny Kitagawa legitimize and justify all the soul ripping as offenses in which he has conducted onto the boys? I believe you guys already know the answer to the question, with the answer being an absolute and resounding no. Hattori Yoshitsuku, a Japanese actor, confessed that he was taken physical advantage of by Johnny starting from the age of when he was 8 years old. 8 years old. Again. We cannot emphasize enough of how it is just absolutely infuriating that Johnny lived until the ripe old age of 87 molesting these boys and leaving their bedroom after putting a little 10,000 yen note under the boy's blanket with a little smirk on his face. By the way, to his victims who he molested after the 2000s, it is said that he left amounts up to 50,000 Japanese yen or around 330 US dollars. How considerate of him to count for inflation for the boy's sake just after he finished molesting him? and doing this throughout his entire life, not to even receive one hard slap across his face. And that hard slap across his face is still not even anywhere near the type of punishment that he should have received while he was still alive. During Hattori's formative years, he states that he was physically taken advantage of by Johnny for around 100 times in the span of two and a half years. We will not be describing the exact details of what Johnny has done onto Hattori as testified by him as the evil acts committed by Johnny are just way too heinous and explicit to be stated in this video. But the worst kind of abuse you can ever imagine Johnny has done onto Hattori as well as hundreds to thousands of other male minors in Japan. Hattori states that he still has nightmares and sleepless nights of fear and trauma from what happened to him from when he was 8. He says that life ruining trauma such as this does not actually get better over time but actually worsens with age and continues to deteriorate his mental health and sanity. So needless to say, the life of Yoshitsuke Hattori as one unique human being, as a human being, regardless of whether male or female, whether 8 years old or 80 years old, whether rich or poor, whether he was a boy working under Johnny as a trainee or the senior boss of Johnny, but as a human being whose basic rights as a human being should have been upheld and protected, have basically been treated as some meat and flesh toy for a beyond twisted, perverted predator that is Johnny, and as a result, had to endure an entire life of insomnia, pain, and trauma. To quote the exact words of Hattori, in which I believe we all wholeheartedly agree, to quote, it is a big mistake to say that what Johnny has done cannot be helped because he was a genius or a talented music producer. Bad things are always bad. Now, some may look at the very senior nature of this victim and ask, but how is he so old? Did he not state that he was taken physical advantage of by Johnny since he was 8? But then, if we actually dig into the details of just when Johnny Kitagawa began his life of crime against children and teenagers, we begin to understand just why so many Japanese male seniors have recently stepped up to confess of the abuse in which they have received from Kitagawa in the past. The very first report of S offense committed by Johnny onto a male minor goes all the way back to 1958. Ryo Nakatani, a member of the very first boy band created by Johnny Kitagawa, the Johnnies, the band composed of boys who are playing baseball at Yoyogi Park, made several confessions in his expose book published in 1989 with the title Johnny's Counter Attack. He stated that Johnny lured Takatani, who was in 5th grade of elementary school at the time, to come to his apartment near Yoyuki Park, describing his home as a quote-unquote dream castle where he had a bunch of sweets such as Hershey's that were hard to get in Japan at the time, as well as games in which the boys could play with. And on one day when Nakatani was alone with Johnny at his house, that is when Johnny made his move. Nakatani was merely 11 years old when all of this happened. And it seems that he just could not keep his hands off of the boys from the very beginning of his career. In the year 1965, the very year when Johnny first opened his talent agency by the name of Johnny's office, he received a lawsuit from Mr. Taro Nawa, the owner of Nawa Performing Arts Academy, for his obscene S conduct done onto the underage boys. But then, with all of the allegedly victimized boys testifying in court with a quote-unquote I don't remember, this very first S-assault legal case against Johnny Kitagawa was dismissed. But now, 
We now know in retrospect that the boys were lying in court at the time, most likely due to amalgamation of factors, such as coercion and threat from Johnny himself, the societal atmosphere that unfortunately exists in Japan of often posing extreme shame not only to the offender but to the victim for quote unquote causing a scene and committing meiwaku, as well as the boys being plain and simple very young at the time and were most likely scared to death. And how do we know this? It is because one of the very boys who testified with the I don't remember line at the Tokyo High Court was Ryo Nakatani himself, the very person who later wrote his expose book on Johnny in 1989 and detailed all the S offenses that were done onto him from the late 1950s into the 1960s. And Nakatani was by far from being the only ex-Johnny male idol who wrote an expose on Johnny. In 1988, another ex-Johnny idol who was a member of his boy band Four Leaves wrote a book titled Tuikari Genji. And in this book was another expose on the S crimes in which Johnny persistently committed onto his male minor idols. Now, this book was more widely read in Japan compared to Rurakatani's book, Johnny's Counter Attack, and he said to have sold a high number of copies throughout the nation, but still did not receive much coverage from the mainstream media, who were once again too afraid to come across the industry mogul that was Johnny Kitagawa and his powerful talent agency. Another reason why Johnny and his talent agency was so feared across the Japanese media was not only due to the enormous power strictly inside the entertainment industry, but on a broader level in the Japanese power hierarchy with their political ties as well. Now some low to mid-tier political connections. Connections to the elite legacy families in Japanese politics, such as the Yasuhiro family, and on the July 13th, 1989 edition of the Weekly Bunshun, one of the most influential investigative journalism magazines in Japan, it was claimed that the former Japanese Prime Minister, Yasuhiro Nakasone, was a homosexual, and that he received a steady stream of underage male idol trainees from Johnny Kitagawa. This is a method in which we often describe as the pillow sales method in Japan. And while many elements of the whole pillow sales method can be regarded as highly questionable and unsound in and of itself from a human rights perspective, the questionability and downright criminal nature of this practice becomes exponentially more prevalent when it involves underage minors, many of whom who were most likely half forced into the acts by Johnny, who probably told them that this is what they had to do as a quote unquote rite of passage in order to become a huge J-pop star in the future. So in other words, allegedly sent the steady stream of male minors to certain politicians under the excuse of the infamous shogunai or it is what it is, it cannot be helped line that is permeated to the core in the Japanese society. So there were the obvious conspiracies that whenever a claim or lawsuit of child abuse against John Kitagawa was headed in this way, it was immediately shut down partly as the literal ex-prime minister of the nation would obviously be tied into the whole case the more the issue got excavated. In fact, Kei Honda, an investigative journalist who wrote the book The Collapse of the Johnny Empire in 1998, interviewed one of the victims of Johnny who decided to walk to the police station with his mother filed a report to the Tokyo Metropolitan Police on the S abuse in which he suffered from Johnny. However, the police response at the time was, to quote their exact words, there's no way in the world that the president of Johnny and Associates would do something like that. And after that, the victim testified that there was no further response from the Japanese police. According to the words of some of the detectives whom Honda worked with in the process of writing his book, they stated that the potential reason as to why the Tokyo Metropolitan Police decided to completely ignore and not take action on a serious criminal case such as S offense on underage minors was due once again to the fact that Johnny was highly connected to the former Prime Minister Yasuhiro Nakasone, who also happened to be the very first president of the Japan Music Business Association. But the investigative journalists at Weekly Bunshin did not stop their attempts to expose the true nature of Johnny and bring the truth to public consciousness, with their most famous expose piece being the one in which they wrote in 1999 detailing the type of S exploitation suffered by the Johnny and Associates male trainees. Now, instead of admitting the truth and apologizing, Johnny and his agency had the audacity to then sue Weekly Bunshin of defamation. The more time you live on this planet, the more you get to realize that our world in many aspects is a perfect place for the thick-skinned sick predators such as Johnny Kitagawa to thrive in. 
For any average individual, the sheer guilt after committing unspeakable, life ruining crimes onto hundreds to thousands of minor aged boys would quite literally weigh the individual down and gradually innervate the entirety of their being from the inside. Thus, the reason why many criminals ultimately break down and confess during the police or prosecutorial questioning despite their initial attempts to lie, or sometimes even decades after committing the crime as they can just no longer handle the internal guilt. Or even if they don't confess, the sheer sense of guilt and remorse torments many of them on a permanent basis throughout their life, which then could quite literally negatively affect them from the very physiological level by making them have chronically elevated cortisol levels, which then in turn could cloud their judgment and contribute to them making bad decision after bad decision in life and allow them to finally meet their karma and so on, basically self-implode on a gradual basis from guilt. But for the immoral predators such as Johnny, who most likely do not feel a single ounce of guilt and just physiologically do not experience any rise in the cortisol levels after committing the most evil of crimes, a lawsuit against them is just another day in the office for them to lie under oath and commit perjury in court, saying that he did not take physical advantage of a single boy in his life without blinking an eye. But then, there was a thin line of hope in the early 2000s as events finally began to initially look as if justice was about to prevail and Johnny was going to receive the criminal punishment that he more than very much deserves. The Tokyo High Court recognized the child as offense claims against Johnny as, to quote the exact words of the High Court, true in important parts, and that the reports made by Weekly Bunshun regarding the abuse of minors by Johnny were not defamatory, as the Tokyo High Court once again found that the S assault by Johnny have indeed occurred, with the testimonies provided by the victimized boys not being regarded as false testimony. So at this point you might think, game over. The very High Court of Tokyo finalized their judgment that S assault by Johnny have indeed occurred, meaning that Tantama criminal punishment was headed towards his way. But unfortunately, this did not happen. Let us explain why. First of all, while the investigative journalists at Weekly Bunshin probably expected the nation of Japan to now boil over this news regarding the court ruling, the very opposite of this happened in reality. The mainstream Japanese media was more than lukewarm about the court judgment, with the ruling not receiving TV coverage, while some newspapers covered it with these more than brief articles to say the least, located at the back pages of the paper where not many people went on to read. And we also have to keep in mind of the minute details. This legal case was not a case filed against Johnny Kitagawa by Weekly Bunshin or the victims for the sake of convicting Johnny, but actually the very opposite in its technicality, with the case being a one in which Johnny and his company made against Weekly Bunshin, with Johnny and his company attempting to convict the investigative journalists at Weekly Bunshin as guilty under the charges of defamation. Now, to be fair, with the S assault of minor boys being already confirmed as true in important parts by the very Tokyo High Court during the defamation trials, if the victims of Johnny were to step up, not just walk up to the police station themselves as in how one of the victims have done pre-2004, but hire a proper representative lawyer and file a separate S offense lawsuit against Johnny Kitagawa after the defamation trial was finished, it could be highly likely that Johnny would have been convicted guilty. But for whatever reason, none of the victims filed a single lawsuit against him post-2004, despite the fact that the factual nature of Johnny's S offenses has already been proven in court. We believe you guys can already guess some of the potential reasons as to why this happened. Let us put ourselves in the shoes of the victims. As we've mentioned previously, the presence of Meiwako avoidance psychology in the Japanese social atmosphere is just more than very intense, and that is still putting it very mildly. Meiwaku refers to a part of the Japanese culture which refers to the act of causing trouble or harm to others. And when we say that the cultural tendency to avoid Meiwaku or causing trouble to others at whatever cost exists in Japan, there is always going to be that one person in the comment section, you guys have all seen it, who will say, And for the thousandth time, we have never stated that the type of phenomenon or societal issues that we discuss on our channel purely occurs only in Japan. And of course, needless to say, the cultural tendency to avoid trouble or conflict with others do exist in other nations as well. Our point is not made in the lines of confirming its existence or non-existence. Our point focuses on its degree, and we can say with absolute certainty that the cultural push towards avoiding meiwaku under whatever means necessary is the most extreme in its degree in Japan compared to any other nation. Now, to be fair, 
The sheer degree of the Meiwaka of voting psychology in Japan does entail many benefits to the nation and, in many ways, makes Japan the very country that we respect and love so much. There are a large number of benefits that can be mentioned, but let's just name a few for the sake of this video. In my decade plus years of living in Japan, we have never once experienced someone attempting to skip a line. Now, does this realistically indicate that absolutely none of the individuals in Japan do not feel the urge to skip lines? We believe not. In whatever country there is, there are always going to be individuals with a mental framework that are just unscrupulous, to put it most mildly. And in the public setting of many other nations, we can easily spot these unscrupulous beings as they actually physically act out in a way that very effectively demonstrates their innate nature to be selfish and not consider others, skipping lines being one of the best examples. They think that they are the only ones who suffer from waiting in a long line, so just decide to skip lines and cause harm to others who have been waiting way longer than they have and now have to waste even more time in a line due to this Karen type villains. But in Japan, Due to the sheer extreme nature of the Meiwaku avoidance culture that is ingrained into the society, some of the members of the society who may have had this urge to skip a line or two will not dare to actually physically carry it out in real life due to the fear of causing trouble to others who have been skipped or quote unquote cause a scene in a public setting. Let us provide another personal experience as an example. When I have worked a 12 hour day but still am squeezing that last tiny bit of energy that I have to head to the gym and train, I really do not need a complete stranger to start talking to me in the apartment elevator, attempting to start small talk, asking me how long I've been lifting, what supplements I take, how much I can bench, and just have to babysit them by having to hear how they unfortunately fell off from going to the gym for over a month. This is not a therapy session. And me living the longest years of my life in Japan and just being psychologically conditioned in this Meiwaku avoidance societal atmosphere, it really did surprise me in just how much complete strangers in certain other countries attempted small talk. Now, this can somewhat ignite polar opinions as some people state that they actually don't like this aspect about the Japanese culture as it makes people seem cold and distant. Or I've seen some people make a statement such as, Japan is a heaven for introverts, not marriage place for extroverts. And although this statement does contain a partial degree of truth, my elevator anecdote is not really about whether you're extroverted or introverted. It is about caring and considering the current state of others. Like I stated previously, a complete stranger asking me questions, and most of all, find this as an opportunity to rant about how he fell off from going to the gym because of this and that, while I was so mentally fatigued after a 12 hour workday and just found the task of staying up and standing in the elevator in and of itself as a challenging task is fundamentally not about whether I or the stranger next to me is an extrovert or an introvert. It is about putting yourself in the other person's shoes and consider the well-being of the person next to you in the lines of the guy seems like he works out, I want to ask him some questions, but it's late at night and he obviously seems tired, so let me not disturb the person and let him go on with his day. And again, in my case, where I possess a mindset more in line with the Japanese, a person who does not consider any of these thoughts in regards to the current state of the other person before single-handedly making the decision to commence small talk for his or her little spark of pleasure, I believe can be deemed as quite selfish. Again, some residing in the Western or a different cultural setting may disagree with me on this, but these are just my personal thoughts, as in while the words coming out of my mouth may be English, I have never lived in, let alone visited the United States in my entire life, living in Japan since teenhood and also an Asian country before that as well. So please keep that in mind while watching our videos and the perspective that we provide in our videos. But with that said, let us now discuss some of the downsides of the existence of the extreme Meiwaku avoidance culture of Japan. Just like anything else in life, when there is too much of something to the extreme, even if the element is something that is positive in its nature, if inadequate levels, that quote unquote positive element can take a drastic turn and become one of the most painful existences imaginable. Just to provide the most cookie cutter analogy, we can think of the Meiwaku avoidance psychology that pervades in the Japanese culture to having muscle mass on your body frame. Having reasonable amounts of muscle mass on your frame is said to have numerous health benefits from being able to help you control blood sugar levels with your muscle tissue being able to act as a place where glucose could be stored instead of it circulating all around your blood plasma which then could potentially contribute to the creation of health complications such as diabetes to reportedly benefiting on individuals mental health. We all have heard of that one individual who got oneself out of a bad place mentally after starting to lift weights in the gym and follow a more active lifestyle. 
But then, what happens when the seemingly healthy pursuit of packing muscle mass on your frame goes to the absolute unhealthy extreme? Then many begin to get their hands on substances such as steroids, take them in exorbitant amounts, which then can lead to myriad side effects such as enlargement of the heart, liver, and kidney damage. The list just goes on and on. And this is quite frankly, the exact type of ramification in which the sheer insane degree of the meiwaku avoidance psychology of Japan suffers from. Just like how extreme bodybuilders who have taken the pursuit of packing muscle mass to unreasonable levels that goes beyond what our natural physiology allows us have faced tragic outcomes such as early death, the very nature in which the Japanese societal atmosphere takes their meiwaku avoidance psychology which is to the absolute extreme, unprecedented in any other nation around the world, is quite literally pushing many of the members of the Japanese society to the brink of death or pain in levels that are equivalent or more to that of death. Imagine the pain that had to be endured by the thousands of male minor victims of Johnny Kitagawa, having their entire life ruined by trauma created from this evil being, but still be forced in a position to not be able to say anything and watch this evil being who has ruined their life die peacefully of old age in his penthouse in Aoyama, taking physical advantage of other minors in his bathtub, most likely until the very year that he died, without receiving any formal punishment in his lifetime, and still be publicly celebrated by the very prime minister of the nation even after his death. Just imagine this pain. And with that said, let us explain in a simplified manner of how the concept of meiwaku can provide us with a partial insight as to why none of the hundreds to thousands of victims of Johnny Kitagawa never stepped up to file a lawsuit against Johnny Kitagawa while he was alive, even despite the Tokyo High Court ruling of the S assaults by Johnny as true during the Johnny and Associates against weekly Bunshin defamation trials in 2004. Many of you may already be aware of the fact that Japan is perhaps one of the only countries where the victim of a crime or a tragic circumstance still is often socially pressured to come out and apologize for quote unquote causing trouble or causing a scene. Not the perpetrators, the victims. Let us provide some examples that comes to our mind. In 2021, a Japanese voice actress, Sayaka Kanda, was subject to a tragic passing. Many believe that this may have been caused due to an extremely abusive relationship in which she had with Takahisa Mayama, a former Japanese actor and her boyfriend at the time. Although it can't be shown in this video, the voice recording file in which Sayaka recorded prior to her passing just shows the sheer degree of psychological abuse in which Mayama have committed onto her. Mayama did not offer a single apology to the victim's family and received no criminal punishment. But then, the parents of Sayaka Kanda, when conducting interview in front of the journalists, apologized to the Japanese public for quote-unquote causing a scene with her daughter's passing and the background story behind her passing while holding the box containing the ashes of their daughter's dead body in their very hands. I do have to admit, I shed a few tears when I had to watch two parents go through all of this while holding the very ashes of their only daughter. Life can be cruel to us sometimes, and this especially applies to many of the good, innocent civilians living in the land of Japan. And we can name hundreds of more instances, such as this, of the unfortunate cases in Japan where the victims are apologizing for the trouble in which they have caused while the perpetrators remain silent. But you guys get the idea. We cannot have this video be like 3 hours long. The core point here is that, in the societal atmosphere of the island nation of Japan, if you're the victim of a crime, as unfair and wrong as it is from the most basic human rights perspective, the reality is that you cannot just think in the lines of reporting the crime to the police, have the criminal prosecute it, and make them receive the criminal punishment in which they very much deserve. You have to like, as hard as this is to explain, please bear with me on this, as a victim, you also have to consider the scene that you'll be creating by making the crime be publicly known and the subsequent trouble that you'll be generating to the other members of the neighborhood or the society at large. And imagine this quote-unquote scene in which the victims of Johnny will be creating to the Japanese society at large by filing a lawsuit against the god of J-pop himself. He is god. He's god. He is god. The creator of the national boy band SMAP, as well as numerous other creme de la creme male bands and singers in Japan. The quote-unquote trouble that they'll be causing to the nation, especially to the devout fans of the nation's top boy bands such as Smup and Arashi, will be absolutely unquantifiable. Having the very leader who scouted the very beloved members of Smup convicted as an S-offender who prey upon young boys and sent into prison. 
This will obviously mean a tarnished image for the Jonian Associates boy bands, negatively impact their future activities as singers, actors, and variety show guests, and so much more. The Lulu fans do not only exist in K-pop. Just as much as there are the Delulu fans who still attempt to defend a bona fide criminal such as Seung Yi who was convicted with 9 charges, not 1 or 2 but 9, just covering their eyes and shouting, my opa did nothing wrong, my opa did nothing wrong, I don't hear you, I don't hear you, just complete clowns. You can be rest assured that some of the most fervent fans of Japan's most popular boy bands were also quite quote unquote intense to put it most nicely and not to even mention the straight up direct fear for their very life of being an enemy to a powerful figure such as Johnny Kitagawa. I mean, knowing the type of evil being in which all the victims very well know that he was, who also unfortunately happened to have the most power, connections and authority in most likely all of J-pop, the victims all know that if he puts his mind to it, he can easily conduct retaliation in the worst way possible. You all know the randomly falling down the stairs on a normal day type of stories that are faced by the victims all around the world who dare to expose a powerful figure of their crimes. And those stories are no exception to Japan as well, especially for residents living in certain areas of Shinjuku. So if we really put ourselves in the shoes of the victims, can we really blame any of them for not being able to muster up that last bit of courage to convict Johnny Kitagawa post-2004 after the defamation trials, knowing the type of societal atmosphere where the victims live in? I don't think so. Now, another prominent reason as to why the voices of the victims of Johnny Kitagawa were shushed to such a drastic extent in Japan in which not many people know or at least discuss about is the fact that the whole idea of male as assault victims were not and still in large parts are not socially recognized in Japan along with the lack of legal structure in Japan that defend the individuals of the male gender from becoming potential victims of S abuse. To elaborate, until recently in the year 2017, when laws regarding male S crime victims were revised for the first time in 110 years, victims of crimes such as aggravated R were literally limited only to women in Japan. But as we all know from the cases of the hundreds to thousands of male victims of Johnny, individuals of the male gender, especially when underage, can very well become victims of S violence. Furthermore, according to Japanese psychologist Koichi Miyazaki, there is also a psychological element as to why more number of SSO or male victims statistically go unreported. To quote Dr. Miyazaki, male victims are unable to recognize the damage and are unable to contact counseling institutions, so the problem tends to remain latent. And I believe for many of the male audience on our channel, we do not have to be victims of S violence to viscerally understand what Dr. Miyazaki is saying here. When we suffer from certain traumatic experiences of crime or blatant injustices in life, we are literally often told to man up. You might have heard of this despicable phrase, what are you, a girl? Such a short phrase that goes on to offend both men and women. And according to the eminent social psychologist Hofstede, Japan ranks as one of the most masculine societies in the world, meaning that this whole idea of man up is even more prevalent and psychologically ingrained from a young age to a lot of the male individuals in Japan. And we can conspicuously perceive this from how the Japanese media reacted to the allegations of S-abuse by Johnny to the underage male trainees. When the reporters of Japan's Mainichi Shimbun, one of the oldest and largest newspapers in Japan, have heard about the allegations against Johnny, it is said that they merely scoffed and said, the victim is not a woman. Emi Tabana, who worked as a writer for the Asahi Shimbun, another prominent newspaper in Japan, said that the reporters at the time did not understand the concept of S assaulting males and how it transgressed basic human rights. To quote the words of one of the reporters from Asahi Shimbun, as recalled by Emi Tabana, to quote, I don't understand how men could be victims. On July 18th, 2019, while it is Aoyama penthouse, or how he used to describe his home when luring boys back to his home, his quote-unquote dream castle full of sweets and games, Johnny complained of not feeling well and was subsequently rushed to the hospital. So there went the god, or the apex predator of J-pop, without ever receiving a single set of punishment for his half a century plus years of crime against male minors. And based on how the set of events went along immediately after his death and a few subsequent years afterwards, it seemed as if things were going to stay that way forever, with Johnny remaining as an admired icon of the industry. But somewhat thankfully, 
Again, true justice cannot be served as Johnny has already passed at this point. But beginning from 2022, a sequence of events occurred that led to the lifetime of S abuse committed by Johnny to his male idol trainees to finally be brought to international and subsequently the Japanese public consciousness. While many may have already seen the 2023 press conference of Kawano Kimoto in which he bravely conducted, where he exposed the fact that he was taken physical advantage of by Johnny during his time as a Johnny's junior member, not a lot of people are aware of the fact that the first instance of Okamoto accusing Johnny Kitagawa of S abuse in a public setting happened in fact in 2022 when he conducted an interview with a Japanese YouTuber. However, we already just know from all the precedents in which we've mentioned throughout this video of what happens when the discussion of S abuse by Johnny remains in the Japanese domestic realms. Yes, nothing much happens. Despite the shocking nature of the content in which Okamoto exposed during 2022, none of the mainstream Japanese media reported on it, with of course, absolutely no response from the side of Johnny and Associates. But then in March 2023, a pivotal moment arrived in this half a century plus long journey of bringing the evil true nature of Johnny Kitagawa to the public consciousness. The BBC released an investigative documentary into the SOB's allegations against Johnny Kitagawa, subsequently bringing this issue to international spotlight. Then on April 12th, 2023, Okamoto once again stepped up and held a press conference detailing the abuse in which he and the other minor male trainees of Johnny suffered from him. Again, we cannot commend Okamoto enough for bravely stepping up for sake anonymity despite the obvious potential dangers of doing so and discuss such traumatic events from his past in such a calm and professional manner. And he did not make the same mistake as in 2022 of keeping the discussion limited within domestic realms by talking to Japanese journalists, by deliberately calling upon foreign journalists from the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan or the FCCJ. So with the issue of past S abuse of male minors by Johnny Kitagawa receiving spotlight around the world to levels previously not experienced in the long but unsuccessful history of attempts to expose his crimes beginning all the way back from the 1965 now performing arts academy trials, the very United Nations Human Rights Council ultimately stepped into the issue and conducted an extensive probe into all of the S abuse cases made against Johnny Kitagawa. And in August 2023, the UN Human Rights Council directly announced, to quote, The perceived inaction by the government and the business involved among victims that we met in this case highlights the need for the government as the primary duty bearer to ensure transparent investigation of perpetrators and that victims obtain effective remedies, be they in the form of an apology or financial compensation. And now, it was really game over for the executives at Johnny & Associates. With keeping face one of the most important facets of the Japanese societal atmosphere, there was no way that now with the entire world watching, the government would just allow Johnny and Associates to still not apologize and remain silent and be globally stigmatized as a nation that condones child abuse. So shortly after the United Nations Human Rights Council announcement on September 7, 2023, Julie K. Fujishima, the niece of Johnny Kitagawa and president of Johnny and Associates at the time, formally apologized to the victims of Johnny's past S abuse and promised to provide financial compensation to all of the victims. So far, so good. But then, what still angered many Japanese people who knew the minute details of the situation was the following. With Julie K. Fujishima's resignation, a former member of Johnny's male idol group Shonen Tai, Noriyuki Higashiyama, was now appointed as the new CEO of Johnny & Associates. But how is this so controversial? This is because Higashiyama is also allegedly responsible for S abusing Johnny & Associates minor male trainees as an individual working as what many would deem as a right-hand man of Johnny for many decades. According to another victim, a former Johnny's male idol member, Shogo Kiyama, who took the courage to speak out about what Higashiyama did to him while he was still a male trainee during his teenage years at Johnny & Associates, Higashiyama allegedly took out his quote-unquote body part in front of Shogo and told him to, to quote Higashiyama's exact words, eat my sausage. And that's not everything. According to Kiyama, he stated that Higashiyama often addressed him, took his hand, and forcefully brought him to the room where Johnny was. Then you guys can obviously guess what Johnny did to him afterwards. Now, to be fair, this is not count for one former male idol, so whether all of these confessions are facts do indeed have to be verified. And during the September 7th, 2023 press conference, a reporter asked Higashiyama about whether these allegations of his past S abuse of the trainees were true, in which he initially replied, no, I don't think it's true. 
But then, another reporter told him to stop lying and reveal the truth. Then Higashiyama's voice begins all shaking, and like, as unbelievable as this is, this is literally what Higashiyama said, word by word, to quote, Maybe I have done it, maybe I have not done it. As in, are you serious? Are you kidding us right now? We all know that this can basically be translated as, yes, I have done it, but I'm not just going to admit it in front of everyone in public. He obviously just can't keep denying it due to the highly likely existence of latent victims and his fear that if he lies and blatantly deny all allegations, they may potentially step up as in the case of how Okamoto stepped up against Joni Kitagawa and put Higashiyama in further trouble. So the question then has to be asked, out of all people whom Joni and Associates could have appointed as their next CEO, why did they have to select this particular individual, a Joni Kitagawa right-hand man who along with Joni allegedly took physical advantage of and provided life-lasting trauma on male teenagers such as Shogo Kiyama in the past, allegations in which he himself cannot even properly deny? And what does this really tell you about the nature of the quote-unquote apologetic stance in which the higher-ups at Johnny and Associates as an organization have towards the victims? I mean, sure, we found out after research that Higashiyama was the absolute favorite of Mary Kitagawa, the oldest sister of Johnny Kitagawa, as well as the individual who effectively controlled and ran the management side of Johnny and Associates until her death in 2021 who wanted Higashiyama to eventually be the person to take over the leadership of the Jonin Associates empire. However, the special reoccurrence prevention team formed by Jonin Associates after receiving international and governmental pressure to investigate properly on Jonin's past conduct have found that it is highly likely that Mary Kitagawa have already known about the quote-unquote abnormal as preference over younger brother from the early 1960s. And with the investigation team stating that Mary has had a mother and son relationship with Johnny, with their mother passing away only when Johnny was two years old. The fact that Mary always tried to completely cover up the crimes of her younger brother rather than chastising him for his heinous conduct and attempt to make him stop. The investigation team claimed that she was the biggest reason for the length and spread of the damage in which Johnny has committed onto the victims over the years. So then, the obvious question has to be asked. Was it so important to keep the wishes of the late Mary Kitagawa in terms of whom she wanted the new CEO of Joni Associates to be when she was effectively the biggest accomplice of Joni by, to quote the words of the special reoccurrence prevention team covering up Joni's assaults from beginning to the end? Now, Higashiyama may indeed be repenting in a genuine manner and is sincerely focused on making sure that such unspeakable crimes as committed by Joni, as well as allegedly himself in the past, is to never again occur in the talent agency. But the fact that the very new CEO of Johnny & Associates that was brought in in order to apologize for the office's past conduct and make sure that similar crimes never happen again is also the individual who allegedly physically brought the boys to the very hands of Johnny and laughed his brains off while all the molesting was happening in real time just seems more than wrong on so many levels. It's like as if the former headmaster of your school from the year 1965 to 2019 who passed away a few years ago got revealed as an S-offender who abused many of the students at the school during the time he was alive. So the school board apologizes and fires the current headmaster who is the niece of the late S-offender former headmaster. And in the promise of ensuring that such crimes never occur within the school again, bring in a new headmaster who allegedly actively helped out the late S-offender headmaster as his right-hand figure during the time he was alive. Then in the next school board meeting, the parents asked the new headmaster whether he has indeed also as exploited some students in the past, in which he replies, maybe I have done it, maybe not. You do not have to be a saint or have quote-unquote puritanical norms as some have accused us for having in some of our videos for saying what we believe is just the most baseline of baseline thinking in which we should universally have as human beings, such as how no child of a family should have to leave their home because her father constantly attempts to take physical advantage of her to know that the hiring of Higashiyama, especially at this particular point of the company's history when they are quote-unquote sincerely apologizing and are proposing preventative measures to avoid further male teenage victims, is just not right on multiple ways. And many people in Japan who have been following this issue obviously thought in similar lines as us as well, with the phrase my sausage trending in various Japanese search engines after the September 7th press conference. But now, to be fair, does this mean that the victims of Johnny had absolutely no closure at all? 
not necessarily as the victims did indeed receive a formal apology from the side of Jonin Associates and received the 90 degrees Sakurai bow that is conducted in Japan when showing a sense of deep regret and remorse. But the unfortunate suspicions currently surrounding the aspect of financial compensation is that it is the very greed of some of the members of the Joni Kitagawa Victims Association that is keeping the rest of the victims shushed when it comes to raising their voice against the appointment of Higashiyama as the new CEO. So as sad as this is, it has been criticized in Japan that some of the representative members of the Joni Kitagawa Victims Association just want to get paid. So now that the company has indeed promised a decent financial package for the victims, they do not want to unsmoothen and delay this process by raising further issue with the newly appointed CEO and cause more of a scene that could potentially jeopardize the fluid nature of the financial compensation process. This is obviously not good for many of the victims of Johnny who could not care less about any financial compensation but just want genuine closure and healing of the psychological wounds. So as the Victims Association gradually morphed itself into a group with the sole goal of getting paid rather than being the voice that delivered the pain suffered by the victims of Johnny, many of the victims left the association. It is once again regrettable to witness this as the actions of the handful of these greedy members of the Victims Association is partly contributing to the loss of Japanese public support for the rest of the victims. A Japanese citizen turns on their TV, sees these oily members of the Victims Association just talking about money, money, and more money. Then they might think in the lines of, look at these supposed victims only caring about money. They were probably like this back in their teenage training days as well, volunteering to be physically taken advantage of by Johnny to get paid just like how they're doing now. Johnny, these quote-unquote victims, they are the same line of people and deserve no sympathy. The very motto of Johnny Kitagawa during his lifetime was the phrase, the show must go on. Perhaps he created this motto in his twisted mind, perceiving himself to be this victorious being who has persisted through all of the quote-unquote adversities in life, with the adversities in his mind being how his victims over the years often quote-unquote acted out of line and attempted to expose the past as exploitation conducted by him onto them and thought in the lines of, no boy whom I molested in the past, present, or future will stop me from continuing my show. Whether they write expose books on me, conduct interviews with investigative journalists, or sue me in court as in 1965 and 2004, the Johnny show must go on. So as downright creepy as his motto sounds, this was indeed the overarching maxim of Johnny in which he firmly advocated throughout his lifetime and was regrettably quite successful at it as well as he was able to continue this egregious quote-unquote show of his that left 478 reported male victims of ex-assault and probably much more if accounting for all of the unreported victims until the very day that he died without ever being punished. So our sincere hope is that now that Johnny Kitagawa is gone and that the history of his past as crimes have been disclosed to the world, Higashiyama and the rest of Johnny's agency are not still committed to the show must go on motto of Johnny Kitagawa in the worst way possible. Now, it goes without saying that the company would be absolutely insane to commit another similar lines of s abuse crimes onto their teenage male trainees with now the entire world watching. So we very much doubt and sincerely hope that such forms of direct, blatant form of s abuse will never manifest itself again at Johnny's agency. However, if it turns out that the Johnny's executives were not 100% sincere with their apology and had even the slightest sense of vengeful sentiments towards the victims of Johnny, we cannot neglect the possibility that, when all the storm clears, they can indeed very much return back to their way of power abuse, again most likely not in such a direct form as physically conducting R on the male trainees as committed by Johnny, but other forms of more indirect, passive aggressive forms of power abuse to the male trainees. I mean, many of us already know that the hiring of Higashiyama as their new CEO out of all the competent CEOs who do not possess direct SBS allegations against them in which the company could have chosen from can already be interpreted as this very indirect, passive-aggressive, subtle middle finger raised not only to the victims of Higashiyama but to all of the victims of Johnny Kitagawa, demonstrating the company's firm commitment and belief into how the Johnny show must go on, regardless of this victim or that victim. So all we can do for now is to hope that Higashiyama and rest of the upper executives at Jonin Associates genuinely repent and regret the conduct of their past founder as well as the current CEO, not to even mention the past conduct of the management side of the company led by Mary Kitagawa, who always did whatever means necessary to hide and cover up Johnny's crimes. 
But with that said, it will be realistically quite difficult for Higashiyama. And now the Smile Up Company, yes, despite the firm initial commitment shown by Higashiyama during the September 7th press conference on how he still did not plan to get the word Johnny out of the company name, they had no option but to do so in the subsequent month of October 2023 after a significant number of major corporations such as Suntory, Japan Airlines, McDonald's Japan, Asahi, and more announced that they will no longer hire male talents associated with joining associates and terminate existing contracts. So rather begrudgingly, they decided to finally leave the word Johnny out of the agency's name and rename themselves as Smile Up Incorporated. So the realistic standing of Johnny's talent agency as of current in the Japanese entertainment industry, while still undoubtedly powerful, is no longer this godlike, industry monopolizing force in which they used to be. So the tantamount degree of power abuse in which they used to conduct in the past, from forming unfair contracts to being able to cover up cases of crime through political and media connections, will now be hard for them to conduct, regardless of whether the board of executives of the company feel a genuine sense of remorse and regret or not. We would like to end the video on this note. What many of the victims of Johnny all agree upon is the fact that such cases of S abuse is not limited only to the male idols at Johnny and Associates, but the Japanese entertainment industry at large with its strict, closed nature. But despite many of the victims of Johnny constantly emphasizing this and thus urging on the fact that the entire entertainment industry should take the scandal more seriously, no other victims from other entertainment agencies in J-pop have stepped up to have their voices heard. This goes back to the pattern in which we discussed previously in some of our other videos of the subsequent steps in which the Japanese society takes with an issue such as this. If you guys have watched the Understanding Meiwaku portion of this video, you'll know exactly why this happens without the necessity for much further explanation. First, hide the news of the crime from surfacing as much as possible. Then, attempt to hide it even more under whatever means necessary as done by Mary Kitagawa to cover for her little brother's crimes. But then, if the crime does inevitably surface to the public consciousness to the point of no return, then everybody acts as if they have heard such news for the first time, act like the most morally upright keepers of justice, acting as if they cannot believe such atrocities was happening all along in the peaceful, harmonious land of Japan. But then, by now, we all know what this is. All of us living in Japan know that such injustices, so egregious to be spoken with our mouths, occur on a daily basis in this island nation, but are just kept under the surface. So the whole we are so shocked, this is so bad, we never knew it was happening act, is another important facet of the Japanese societal atmosphere, kind of like a contract in a sense between one another, of keeping face. This person verbally says that they never knew, while the person next to them also verbally says that they never knew, under the tacit contract and understanding between them that yes, they in fact very well both knew and are quite unsurprised, but is required under the Japanese social contract to react in this way in the public setting to maintain face and look morally upright. But just how healthy and sustainable such an intense, suffocating, and oftentimes blatantly human rights transgressing social contract that is silently but forcefully imposed upon its citizens to endure is a question that leaves much for debate. We are sure that many of the Joni Kitagawa like figures of quote unquote godlike authority in the Japanese entertainment industry who are abusing the powerless trainees, both male and female, at this very moment while forcing them to remain silent are watching how all of this is playing out and are thinking in the lines of stupid johnny san he never made sure to shut his victims up properly so they're all acting out of place now causing trouble and we sincerely hope that such predators still out there in the japanese entertainment industry as warned by the very victims of johnny kitagawa as well as undoubtedly in the entertainment industries all around the world at large get found and punished sooner than later and not be given the privileged fate as enjoyed by Johnny Kitagawa in his lifetime, continuing to molest minors for more than half a century and leave countless traumatized victims in the process, only to never get punished and die a peaceful death of old age.